I'm Paul Price, I'm the CEO and I, uh, founder of ISA. Uh, started this about 15 years ago. And I've seen a lot of architects during that time. We have uh, chapters in uh, 40 countries. We've done ITARPs pretty much all over the world. I, I've yet to have an ITARP in Africa. Otherwise, we've got it covered. Uh, everywhere you go, I, I'll tell you a little case study of why we do this. So recently, I had a gentleman move from uh, the U.S. where his company was utilizing some of the skills and taxonomies of ISA, uh, our body of knowledge, etc. Moved back to Sweden. And when he moved to Sweden, he went into his company and the reason he got his job was because he used the skills and taxonomies and the structures that uh, ISA has come up with throughout the years. Um, and we were chatting at the ITARP there and he said, you know, the reason I stay doing this is because it connects me with actual best practice. Now think about that. What does that mean? I don't actually like the words best practice. I like the words um, good practice. I like the words working practice because it, it, it assumes that there's one answer. Best practice assumes there's one way of doing things. What ICE has done is to focus on people as opposed to process. Um, just want to real quickly thank Mr. Phil Helm, by the way, for putting this together. He, he did not get paid to do this. He's a volunteer. He works in both uh, And did it to, through superhuman effort. <laughs> but it is exactly that that I mean. It is the ability to duplicate working practice. This is one of the only fields in which we do not share our failures and our successes in a way that they're repeatable. This is also one of the only fields in the world in which process tools and cheap labor come before excellence and professionalism. That's something we're trying to change. And that's the whole point of this. Great people doing great work. So I want to thank all of you for coming out this morning. I know it's to an information rich environment where all devices recognize us, where the building knows we're there, where, the, where every step of our sales force is recorded inside of the retail environment, where our shoes know how many, know how many steps we take, where our belt knows where it is, where the umbrella tells us the weather, where every device and every everything we interact with interacts back. And that puts you in an unbelievably important position for the future of business. Up till now, you're probably, how many of you are from IT? How many of you are titled architects? Cool. It's about 75%, but everybody said IT. You know, IT, they, they like to say IT is going away, or it's not, you know, there won't be an IT in the future. That's, I think that's a, a silly conversation. It's not about IT going away or not. It's about how important technologists are to business models. The, the job market for technology skills is doubling on a regular basis. So whether IT as a business unit is going away isn't the conversation. It's how important are you to the next generation CEO? talk a little bit about um, a, a new architecture that we've developed for high performance analytics. Uh, this journey started in June seven years ago in Singapore. We were at a conference, uh, one of the SAS conferences in Singapore, and a banker came up and said that there are risk computations and they were using our software. It was taking 18 hours. And so the markets the next day had already opened before they had, had, they, they had a picture of their value at risk. So he said, can you try to make, can you try to make it a little faster? Well, I think it was 18 hours, we surely, surely we could make it a little faster. So he came back, studied the, uh, I'll talk about risk people to understand the computations that they were doing. And it was fairly straightforward and just developing a, uh, various covariance matrix of all the um, uh, all the risk factors, 
and they, they had about 10,000 risk factors. And then uh, they, they convert that to a Koleski, and then you can multiply by normal zero, one random variables, add the means back in, and you have a, what is called a, a potential market state. So you do that 100,000 times, you generate 100,000 market states. Then you price all your commodities and all your stocks and everything at, at those market rates. And then that, that'll give you a number, 100,000 numbers that you can then make a distribution out of and, and, and use the 95 percentile as your estimate of your value of risk. Um, well, it, this particular job needed over two trillion operations to, to, to perform. So uh, 18 hours is about, it's about the right amount of time. So the question was, let's, we're gonna have to break this up and run it on multiple machines. And that, that's uh, where our journey began to use many, many machines uh, using massive and parallel computing keeping almost all the data in, in, in memory if possible, so that when we have to iterate over and over again, like you do on some of the machine uh, machine learning uh, problems, the data is in memory, so you don't have to be constantly reading the data over and over and over again because it just stays in memory. That's the biggest biggest cost of, of an IT job is the high of some of the computations we do. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at machines now that they're operating three billion instructions a second. So it's, it's, it's I.O. That, that, that's the killer, and that's what, that's what you want to avoid. So um, that 18-hour job, we got it down to 12 minutes by, by using massive and parallel computing. And um, that we, we had that done by, by Thanksgiving of, of uh, seven years ago. And over the next three months, we took the basic underlying uh, uh, APIs that we were using and solidified those and then had everybody in our analytics group begin to program to those interfaces so that, that, so that all of our analytical procedures could be running in massive and parallel mode. And that, then we did that. And then a couple of years later, we decided that we really wanted a, 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 a server that stayed up all the time that had the data already in memory so that we could pass requests to it and, and then visualize, visualize our data. So, so you've got seven million observations and you want to get a, an estimate of what, what, what does it look like. And uh, visual analytics get, get, give, gives us that, that capability. Now, a lot of new things had to be developed to visualize 7 million observations. Let's say uh, you do not want to, let's say you're plotting uh, an X versus a Y plot, you do not want to bring 7 million XY pairs down to, the, to your browser to put on the screen. It, it's going to take too long. So there we began to develop this concept of bucketing. So we know that min and max. So we, we created uh, 100 buckets on the uh, vertical, maybe 150 on the horizontal. And then, and then, then we plotted the 7 million pairs in, 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 the, in that grid. And then we downloaded the grid to the, to, to the browser for display. Likewise, things like computing the uh, median or, in, or any, any particular percentile. The way we always did in the past, we would sort the data from high to low. But, but that is not practical in this environment because the data is spread out over multiple machines. So instead, we go back to bucketing. We create a you know, thousand buckets and tell each machine, give me a count of how many you got in each one of these buckets. And then we're able to isolate down to a single bucket where the median is or, or which percentile you're looking for. And then we can go through it again and, and find, you know, make, make a bit finer approach for that. So we did that and that became our visual analytics product. And then we realized that we really want to combine these two. 
there really should not be two different ways to do this. One is visual analytics and the other is, uh, is pro programmatic interfaces. So we decided we were going to rewrite this, this fancy server that we had and we began that process about three years ago. Um, the, the, and, and what we did was to take advantage of everything that we had learned over the previous years in developing our high performance and in our in memory at work. So what we ended up with is a, a, a grid of, of servers, as you see here. We, we accept a message coming up and, and, and we're always talking to the controller. The controller then, based on how, how many servers are, are, are under its control, decides to split it up and, and assign a part of the job to each one of the, of the servers. And so you send a note to the server to tell you each server what to do. They then split it up amongst all the threads that are running on that machine. Because today's architecture, with the, with, and we concentrate on um, what we call commodity, uh, commodity hardware, and, uh, and that's made by Dell and HP and Lenovo. Uh, and what, what it does is uh, use the Intel chips and, and uh, I'll, I'll get into the Intel chips in a minute. But, but the idea is to not only let SAS procedures talk to this, but let any, any other language talk to it. All the computation is done on, this, on the servers up there. First thing you do is read all the data in the memory and, and uh, divide it up so that everybody's got their fair share of data. And then we load actions. The actions are things like regression, uh, logistic regression. Uh, it might be uh, deep neural networks. Um, but we, we load those uh, actions in and then each, each, uh, each server does its piece of the work and then sends the results back to the controller. And now uh, if it's an iterative process, the controller gathers up all the data that's being sent back to it and sends it back down to, to the servers, to the workers to, to do another iteration. So this goes on back and forth a number of times until we have converged to a solution. And then that is sent back down to wherever it came from, either Visual or Python or, or, or SAS or whatever. Let's take a look at today's architecture that we're using. Uh, this, is a, this is a blade. Uh, you've got two choices in servers. you either got blades or pizza boxes. And pizza boxes, uh, we, are, we tend to use even more pizza boxes now because you can get like 21 discs on it. But, uh, but blades, uh, this is, this is uh, what a blade looks like. Let me, let me take these, uh, those are heat sinks. They, 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 these, these chips are so hot that uh, you have to uh, get all that heat out of them. It's like a 100 watt bulb burning all the time. So the heat sinks to help dissipate that. Today's architecture from Intel is either Broadwell or Haswell. Haswell is a 22 nanometer uh, chip, and the um, Broadwell is 14 nanometers. And that's uh, incredibly much, much smaller than the human hair. And, and that is the wavelength of the light that is used to etch the, the silica. So we're down to 14 nanometers now. I think the next generation will go down to 10 nanometers. But at 14 nanometers, uh, you can put a lot of uh, you can put a lot of uh, circuitry on there. As a matter of fact, today's machines, what we're ordering right now, uh, are 18 cores uh, on, on each chip. These, these range all the way up to 22 or 24 cores. And, and each core, of course, has, has its own CPU. And um, this graphics, everything is on a core that's on a, on, a, on, a, on a primary main computer. So you've got 18 computers on each chip. And each chip, and each thread, or each core can be multi-threaded. And, um, 
they call it hyper-threading. And the hyper-threading allows for two uh, threads or two processes to run on each one of the uh, on each one of the uh, cores. So in, all in all, in this we, we will end up then with 72 processors, processes or threads on this on this uh, blades, blade box, and they're running at over three million instruct three billion instructions a second. They range anywhere from two and a half to three and a half billion a second. So and the amazing thing, you know, when, when I first started computing, it used to take eight, maybe eight machine cycles to do a floating point operation. But they've got so much circuitry in here, they can do it in a single, single pulse, a single, a single operation. You can do an entire floating point multiplier or add. So um, that's that's where we are today. Um, Intel does does a process they call it tick tock tick tock right twenty so they shrunk it to twenty two nanometers the previous generation down to twenty two then they improve it and that stays at twenty two but that's that's the top so now they've just done another tick and that's to shrink the uh, Haswell architecture down to fourteen nanometers and then the top will be to improve the microarchitecture and add, add additional features. So, memory, um, so I just pulled out these memory cards. Today's uh, Best Buy is 32 gigabyte DIMMs. And if you put 32 of those on, on, a, on a blade, you've got a terabyte of memory. And that's gonna cost around $12,000 for a terabyte of memory. We typically order 256 gigabytes, which is about $3,000. So uh, I, I thought I would just show that we can actually go up from terabyte quite easily with 32 DIMMs. Next, let's um, take a look at disk. Uh, each blade comes with two disks, and each, each disk is currently, that we just started ordering 1.8 terabyte disk, and there's two of those on there, so you've got 3.6 terabytes of data storage on this one blade. And the, the, the cost of the whole thing is somewhere around $12,000. But it, that's with the 256 gigabytes of memory, so it's incredibly inexpensive. Uh, Dell and HP and Lenovo are all competing in the market, so you can really get some good prices when you work with them. So, to me, this is this is the future of computing. You've got IBM talking about getting out of the hardware business. Uh, hardware has got to be fairly low margin, and they want to IBM wants to move into software, where the margins are a little bit higher. So now in the data center, this goes into a, a large rack about the size of, of a refrigerator. If you put 16 of these, it, 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 it's called a chassis. And then if you put the three chassis in, you, get, you end up with 48 different uh, uh, servers. 3,456 processes can run in parallel on those machines. And 48, if you've got a terabyte on each of the machines, you've got 48 terabytes of memory and 172 terabytes of disk. Now, I was saying that for things like our Hadoop environments, we want a lot more of this because we're going to triplicate everything that we write. And there we usually go to a, a pizza box at 2U, it's two units high, and takes up the whole rack all the way across. And it's, uh, you can get 21, about 21 disks on that, that 1.8 terabyte. So you can put a huge amount of disks on, on one of those machines. And that's that's what we're using mainly for a new environment. So, this allows us to do jobs that we would have never dreamed of years ago. Never, never even thought possible because now we have taken all the arithmetic, all the computations that we do, and we have loaded them on these servers, and, and the job gets broken up and run on, the, on different servers. Uh, we use a, a very simple message passing system to communicate between the servers. Um, 
we have built-in resilience, so if the server goes down, we know what it was working on, we will assign that work to another server and continue on. If the controller goes down, we can almost recover. We, we can recover about 60% of the time on, on, on controllers going down and, and starting up another controller. That's, that's still ongoing work. We'll, we'll get that figured out one of these days. That's hard, that's hard when the whole controller disappears and you have to pick up the pieces and we'll go from there. Well, that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we've been working on for the last seven years. And uh, it actually is, uh, was declared general available uh, produ production this morning. We are looking forward to getting that out in the field. I've got a time for a few questions if you'd like. Yeah. What was your biggest challenge in developing this? Uh, well, getting people to think in parallel. You know, uh, we spent our entire lives programming serially. You know, this block, this block, and, you know, Called it this routine over there and so forth. It's, it's a very, programming is, is a very sequential approach for most of the algorithms. And, and finding different ways to break, break this up and, and run it in parallel uh, is, 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 uh, is one way. Uh, and uh, that was, of course, the most challenging. We were still working on some of our operation and search routines to uh, take, take full advantage of the parallelism. We don't, we don't, this for most of our problems. It scales linearly with the addition of, uh, of servers. Uh, so uh, deciding whether to break up the data into many pieces. The nice thing about the, the approach is that each one of these machines, each one of these servers, shares memory amongst all the processes so that it's shared memory. And we take advantage of that as, a, as, a, as an SMP machine. And we call this MPP, but it's really massively parallel SMP company what it's all about. And uh, we, we have got that down to, to, to an art right now. Yeah. Well, hardware, well, you know, I think HP has just sold off their software unit. Uh, after they spent huge amounts of money buying stuff, and they, they're finally selling it off. Uh, Jenny Romney has declared that they're, they're moving more to software and services versus hardware. Um, well, you know, as long as Intel continues increasing uh, their, their speeds, uh, I think we're in good shape so as, long as, as long as we have them around. You know, these slides, I actually, actually made them about, uh, I was about like four years ago when I first started, when I first showed these. I haven't used them like in a couple of years, so I got them out. And four years ago, we were talking about six cores per, per, per chip. Now we're talking 18 to 20. So, uh, the, and the density just gets more and more dense. They've announced that they, they're, they're testing four gigahertz chip speeds. So that, that's a, you know, a, another billion instructions a second. So it's just, a, it's just amazing what, what we can do with these chips and how, how much we can do. Uh, when you're doing these deep neural networks for machine learning, uh, like they're doing for uh, machine vision, uh, for voice uh, voice translation, I don't know if you ever use uh, Google. The uh, Google is unbelievably good as far as their. Uh, let me let me get out. And show you. It, it amazes me how, how good Google's voice translation is. What's the current temperature? It's 74 degrees in Chapel Hill right now. Oh, hell, Chapel Hill. We don't have <laughs> Well, I don't get it right all the time. <laughs> but, I, all right, I, I spoke into the microphone. A wave file was created. The wave file was sent to, to one of the Google servers somewhere on, in, the, in the world. It was then translated using their deep neural network uh, software, and the, and the translation was then sent back here. And and then they picked it up and tried to search all the items that they found to find one that they can read back and give us the current temperature. 
but it, it hardly ever makes a mistake. It is extremely good at uh, black voice detection. And that's, that's these deep neural networks where you've got this, you know, you know, 50 neural networks across the bottom and then all this feed and all this stuff and they send up to another layer and another layer trying to mimic what the human brain does uh, with respect to neurons. So uh, we, we are we are in, in that game now. That's what, that's, how, that's what they're doing for computer vision. So when you're driving, you know, the computer can recognize uh, uh, obstacles and, and what, what different things are up ahead. So uh, we've got a, a huge future of machines augmenting people as far as cognitive computing, where the computer actually mimics what the humans are doing, how, how humans do things, it helps us remember stuff, it helps look up stuff. And, uh, so we've got an interesting future ahead of us. So, yes? So the test is a large one. How does it find the sustainable and computer about the human beings in space? Well, um, first of all, we are very nimble. I think this is the work that we're do, doing right now is probably five years ahead of anybody else in the industry. So we have never, we have never stood still. We are always moving forward. We've had, uh, we've been, uh, 40 years now since SAS was founded, and we continue to grow every year, and we'll be growing again this year. So, uh, but you, you have to stay nimble, and you have to be inventive, and we encourage an inventiveness at, at, uh, at SAS. Can you talk some how you guys work? How do you understand Well, one of the things that I like to do is to have weekly demos of new things that people are working on so that we can, you know, the upper management can look at look at everything that's going on and, and decide uh, whether we want to fund something, additional funding for a particular project that's going on. Uh, a lot of the things we do come from our users' suggestions. So uh, we, we listen to our users very, very carefully. Uh, we have a, a called SAS Word Ballot that goes out every fall to all of our users. And we've got 80,000 sites around the world that are using SAS right now in 148 countries. <clears throat> so that's a lot of users out there to tell us what, what they, they would like to see. Now some of this high performance computing, they didn't ask for it, but we knew that they would need it as, as the data grows. Uh, one of the other areas right now that we're working on is our event stream processing engine. Uh, we are currently processing uh, two to 300,000 events a second uh, in, in our event stream processing engine. And uh, we're using that for cyber security in the data center to keep track of every connection that's being made in the data center and, and uh, creating alerts when things get out of the norm. But all the cars we're driving, right? You talk about the refrigerators and everything else talking to each other. Uh, event stream processing is what you need to ingest all that data and put it in order and, and match it up with, with other stuff. And you basically do a merge as, a, as it's moving. So we call that data uh, data in motion. And, and we have to process as much as we can locally because you really don't want to send all this stuff back to some server somewhere. You have to initially to be able to create models. But once you've got models, you want to move those out to the edge so that you can uh, do predictions about that at the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Goodnight, can you talk about uh, increases in computing power in smaller spaces? And that's where we need to be in terms of being able to process as much data. Um, so we're talking about Moore's Law, basically. I'm wondering, Moore's Law, which is uh, about significant increases in processing power, um, do you believe that there's any kind of ceiling on Moore's Law that's upcoming? upcoming? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, there's a, a, apparently about a five nanometer limit. Uh, that's the that's about what the wavelength shifts from ultraviolet into X-ray. And you can't etch a chip with X-ray as you go right through it. So, so five, five is going to be, but they'll, they'll come up with multiple, layer, multiple layers and they'll, 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 they'll think of something. But it has been continuing. The, uh, the amount of circuitry, again, the same chip has gone from 22, meter, 22 nanometers down to 14 nanometers. And that means the density, and I think Moore's Law has more to do with the density of transistors on, on, on the silicon. And they are continuing to double 
uh, every 18 months. I think maybe right now it's even a little faster than that. So. Well, thank you very much. I'll have a good conference.